I'm just going to say this. In a Hollywood movie, a French person just gets assaulted by a rat for no reason. I didn't put that in the movie. <laughs> this is right up my alley, but I didn't put that in the movie. That's a plausible plot. <laughs> Here we are on Foreplay. It is our second 90s action film that we'll be discussing. It's Mission Impossible, the 1996 film starring Tom Cruise that uh, rebooted the Mission Impossible franchise as a film series, which is obviously uh, ongoing. Uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning was released actually earlier this year. Uh and it was thoroughly mediocre. But the number it started... is up, by the way. How many are there? Like 10? How many? Oh, how many are there now? Do you know? Eight? I think there's uh, eight. Yeah. Oh, it's like, it's yeah okay. A Fair lot enough. of them, yeah. I think this that is the eighth lot. one, uh, which was thoroughly mediocre. And, of course, uh, over the past 25 years that they've been making these, they make them ever more topical, depending on what is going on historically. Of course, the latest one was about a vague artificial intelligence taking over, of course, because mm -hmm. that's the, the new fear in our modern era. Uh, but this, this is a much more, I would say, tame film up until the very end. And we'll t talk about this one this week. Next week will be Total Recall, the Schwarzenegger one from 1990. And then we'll finish up this arc of the show with Con Air before moving on to our next genre. So Mission Impossible, directed by Brian De Palma, and actually from a screenplay by Robert Town, which some of you will remember if you watched our last arc which was film noir he was actually the academy award winning uh, uh writer screenwriter for chinatown so he's back to write another extremely complicated uh twists and turns thriller with a layer cake of corruption and false motivation plus david kep who uh contributed to a lot of very famous movies like jurassic park among others so in in theory a very strong kind of central creative cast around this from a writing and directing perspective yeah and, and what's interesting is you owe all of that pretty much to tom cruise now uh, mid-90s tom cruise he's not really on his bullshit yet you know he's, he's like not like what happens sort of after this but um this is you know tom cruise's hot property it's the 90s you know he's the quintessential 80s star and this this vehicle is all him. It, I think it was like his production company. Um, Tom Cruise was like a massive fan of the original TV series. Said he always wanted to do a big budget version of that. He is the guy who hired those screenwriters because he admired their work and he knew that they were good from the you know movies that you referenced. In in, in fact, Tom Cruise is directly responsible for the, the hiring of Brian De Palma. He wanted him predicated on the fact he he loved his filmography. He'd seen one or two of the movies. And um, he met him when he was shooting some other film, <clears throat> probably like Interview with a Vampire or something, uh, given the time frame. Uh, Tom Cruise was also becoming like quite friendly with Spielberg. That could have been a thing. But in the end, he went with De Palma. And so... You know, pretty much what's insane about this movie, whether you love it or hate it, um, we wouldn't have this, you know, billion dollar generating franchise if it wasn't for Tom Cruise's vision, which is kind of like, you know, there's, there's, there's probably no better example of star power than sort of what Mission Impossible is. Yeah, yes, but I actually don't particularly care for Mission Impossible, the series. Like, I watched mm. the second one just because it was John Woo and it had, like, an interesting premise. The ones after that, the third one, the, the Philip Seymour Hoffman ones, when I tapped out, I just didn't give a fuck about the rest of them. And then the way they even generate them now just looks so cynical. But I always say, this movie's a pure standalone. You don't need any other movie. In fact, right. if you were even, if you don't even have to know the Mission Impossible TV series, although it will make it not as cool, but if you knew the Mission Impossible TV series and you just saw this movie, mm. it is a really brilliant reinvention of of the idea, like, obviously, when we get to it, the twist is mega, if you know the original premise. Like, it's actually almost like one of those things where you use someone else's... I think it's a great uh, fictional uh, uh, use of, like, artistic license. You use someone else's world building and pretend it built into yours. Sadly, they tried to do that in the modern day of those Bond films. The difference is that doesn't hold up. Like, it's obviously ropey as fuck when they then claim that all these other characters were secretly doing what the one... Because you know they didn't. You know that you just re retconned that now, whereas this works. Yeah. This actually, like, fits on that angle. And I actually think... Then 
reason this one's mega is the director. Brian De Palma is probably the most underrated director ever in the history of Hollywood. Because if I ask you, like, who are the best Hollywood directors? All the classic names, Spielberg, Scorsese, they just go through all the names, Nolan, all that, right? No one ever brings up Brian De Palma. They act like he's some sort of, like, joke or something. Like, if you look at this guy's resume, he's done every type of movie. He's just a really technically sound director as well. Like, great shots, tells a story very well. Look how tight this movie is, by the way. It has, like, very distinct acts and massive action sequences, but it never drags. It never has, like, sections that are too long in the exposition, in, like, the world. But it does it all. So I think this is also just, like, like if I was Ryan De Palma, this is, like, one of my best films I could hold up. I was like, this is what I can do as a filmmaker. Because if people don't know, like I say, of the movies he's done, like, you can go with classics immediately. So, like, Carly Tours Way, one of the all-time greats. People, I think, actually naively think that's, like, a Scorsese film or something, because who's in it? Yeah. Another one, obviously, The Untouchables. No one remembers he did that one. Everyone knows the movie The Untouchables. Somehow they don't know Brian De Palma did it. I think, actually, one of the most under... Scarface is obviously the classic one everyone knows with Al Pacino. I actually think a mad underrated one is that one, Casualties of War, one of the better, sort yeah. of, like, Vietnam movies, if people have never seen it. The one with uh, Michael J. Fox. Michael J. And then, Fox. obviously, the one that he did that, like not enough people have seen even though it is sort of a cult classic is the one uh fucking blowout which is like yep. his Brilliant. reinvention of blow up the old 60s like antonio or one so i think this guy's just a really good director he's one of the ones i forget about myself until i go back on the resume i'm like you know how many this guy did like 10 banger movies yeah i love i love De Palma. i mean like you know it, it's kind of interesting because De Palma is so antithetical to to hollywood and the hollywood system you know, like he is not, um, he's not a studio director. He, all of his films are kind of like very subversive up until a point, you know, when obviously by the 90s, he suddenly becomes a go to guy, you know, for, for the studios when they want to handle these big projects. You know, Scarface, by the way, Scarface was obviously a, a remake of the, you know, 1929 movie. It was the, it was meant to be that just brought into the modern era. Um, and, you know, it was never meant to be, you know, even with Al Pacino in it, it was never meant to be this kind of like runaway iconic movie that, that it was. It was meant to be just sort of essentially, let's do a large budget, you know, remake for Universal of this property that we've got. And obviously he elevated the material you know before that he did carry as well as is, is, is the I other see. one that, which by the way is one of the best stephen king adaptations uh that isn't done by frank darabont um you know fantastic uh, uh dress to kill with michael kane an italian giallo movie for you know ho the, the the hollywood sensibilities uh with michael kane um, and and really, when it when his career kind of like gets interesting, like how you end up having this director do a movie like Mission Impossible, having him picked, handpicked by Tom Cruise, it's actually funny. It's his, it's it's the big flop he had, which was the Bonfire of the Vanities, which um, was this huge budget. You know, it was like fifty, sixty million to adapt a uh, Kurt Vonnegut um, book. Uh, no. Is it Vonnegut Bonfire of the Vanities? Isn't that like a classic, like, oh, well, 18th century work sorry. or something? Am I wrong? Sorry, I I, I, wrong for some reason, I had a brain fart. I was thinking of Breakfast of Champions. No, it's Tom Wolfe did Bonfire of the Vanities. But anyway, yeah, he, um, you know, he, he, he adapted this sort of unadaptable book. You know, Tom Hanks is in it. Bruce Willis is in it. Morgan Freeman's in it. Melanie Griffith, when she was big in it. It, it was this huge, it was, it was meant to be this huge, lavish, Hollywood adaptation, kind of like, you know, sneering at the upper classes. And it absolutely fucking bombed. And it was so high profile a, a bomb. It probably should have ended, it would have ended any other director's career, I think. But the, 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 with, with De Palma, because he had so many like previous good movies, he, it was almost like implicit in the failure. It must have been the studio. Right. And so, and it was, I think it was, it was the first, I, you know, it was like a Warner Brothers project. I don't think he it worked with them a lot. And the studio really wanted the movie to be something it wasn't and hired a director to do something he couldn't do. So I, I like his 90s output is in, like so insanely antithetical to who it is. And, uh, and Mission Impossible really, I like, I'd forgotten it was a De Palma movie. <laughs> like, Same. that, yeah, that's how like wild it is. But it was very apparent immediately. Oh yeah, I'm watching a De Palma movie because of the way he edits his shit and the way he 
builds tension in a scene. I mean, it does show that what Tom Cruise wanted sort of in picking him, he wanted a thriller, not an action movie. A lot of people remember this as an action movie uh, because of the set pieces, which are excellent. They're the best thing about the film, in my opinion. But um, the, the, the way it builds tension and the way it just drops you into this world, I, I, it, it, like I say, there's a lot to like about this film, um, even though I do I do acknowledge I remember it being better than it actually is. <laughs> I, I think it's fun, but uh, at, at the end of the day, this was rather mediocre for me because of mm. some of the flaws in the plot and the way that a lot of character motivations are never really resolved in many ways. Like what? Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Let me let me describe the plot yeah. first. Um, this, because this is what you're here for. This, 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 this is what I'm here for. Uh, so when we talk about this movie, basically it starts off with you have to understand that the I am the mission impossible mission force IMF is basically, you know, a non-registered illegal U.S. government uh, operation. So all of these secret agents that are affiliated with this are will be, you know, if they get caught, they are the U.S. government denies that they are agents for them. So it's an extremely risky job where they carry out very uh, high risk uh, covert operations. So the premise of this film is that Tom Cruise, along with his handler, a man named Jim Phelps, and the rest of the team are in Prague. And they are attempting to stop a an agent from infiltrating the U.S. embassy in Prague to who is trying to acquire a list of C CIA NOC, uh, which is non official cover. So these would be like uh, spies, basically that are not diplomats, right? These are the the people who are in the most danger. So clearly, they are. It's a very highly coveted document because it would reveal the identities of all of the U.S.'s spies. So this would be wanted by foreign governments or could be sold to various, you know, antagonistic governments, uh, terrorist agencies, whatever you want. It would be a very expensive list if somebody were to acquire it and very valuable. Uh, it turns out that there's actually a second IMF team in Prague, and it's really a mole hunt by the U.S. government because they realize that somebody within Tom Cruise's unit is leaking information to outsiders. And so they are trying to use a false operation where, in fact, the guy trying to steal this list is also an agent um, in order to suss out who the mole is. Now, it kind of goes disastrously wrong. A lot of the agents end up dying, uh, ostensibly almost everybody except for Tom Cruise. And then he basically goes on the lam because he believes that the U.S. government thinks that he is the mole because he was the survivor of this encounter. And so he then decides to go after the mole himself uh, trying to figure out who it is, which requires him to get the actual knock list. So he has to infiltrate CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia to get it and then actually, you know, use it as a bargaining tool with a weapons dealer who is attempting to acquire this list to sell to foreign governments to figure out who that mole is. There is a large twist at the end. Stop now if you actually haven't watched this movie, where it turns out that Jim Phelps, his effective boss and handler, is the actual mole. And then they go on a very long and stupid uh, train fight at the end with a helicopter in the Channel Tunnel, which is completely ridiculous. And Tom Cruise wins and everybody's happy. There's a couple of things right there from the plot alone, as you describe it. So one... That's why I said people in the modern day who were like young, they won't be able to appreciate even the context of the movie. Jim Phelps is the character who is in the original TV series as what Tom Cruise is now in this movie. So if there's one thing, essentially, like anyone who is watching this, who is like at the time, like a 50-year-old person or 40-year-old person, they're already set up with the premise that, of course, that can never be the twist. So even mm. if you notice, this is why it doesn't work, actually, as a rewatch. If, when you watch it now, you actually get to that point, like three quarters of the way through, where he starts to even do literally like just very obvious, like, 
but wait a minute, I was in the Drake Hotel. Like when you see that now, you go, it's obvious, isn't it? No, that's the thing. They've made, they've set an, a, a context up where you can never believe that the Jim Phelps guy is actually the one doing it. Like you even just think it's some shit, like he's part of something else going on or he's coming back in some way. Or maybe he was like secretly trying to help them. You, you, you're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, basically. So first of all, that's genius. Because as I say, yeah. you take the whole history of the series and you tie it in with literally, like essentially the analogy is that would be like if to reboot James Bond, it's not he's, it's not actually James Bond, it's the James Bond universe, and James Bond's in it helping out a younger guy, like 009 or whatever, and then James Bond turns out to be the one who's doing all the shit and he has to take him down. Like That is a brilliant premise if you understand the context. And then the other thing is what you said about the whole thing about the knock list, right? That is fucking genius script writing, whoever did that. Because as you say, I think people will actually miss at the beginning, is it's not that they were just betrayed, it's that that never was the real list, that was just a fucking honeypot to draw them out. So the idea that when he's on the run, right, when you're on the run like that, all you should be trying to do is like, you know, fucking prove you didn't do it or like, you know, get away forever. No, no. His mission is, wait a minute, the only way I can actually figure out who did this to me is I have to get the real one, which essentially is impossible to get in like the most insane, audacious hack ever. And then in doing so, then the joke is that even though that itself, if you were evil, would be worth all that money, you're then just going to use that as the chip to find out who originally did the first thing. So I actually think that premise is a brilliant one. Again, who could see that coming if you first time you watch it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that that is really the, the sort of strength of the movie. I, I, I think there's a lot in it um, structurally and performance-wise I definitely didn't fuck with. Like I say, I remember I remembered this movie being like mega in, in my mind because I only really remembered the set pieces and, and the sort of central conceit of the film, which I think is really clever. But... Um, you know, the what I like about the film is the way that, uh, you know, I always have a thing for movies that respect your intelligence and time. And wh while this movie, may maybe you don't need to be super intelligent to follow it, although I would argue the plot is actually kind of convoluted. It's um, extremely yeah. convoluted. <laughs> like yeah. I just said, you can easily mistake some of the things and think they had the real list at the beginning. Yeah, or you, yeah, you know, exactly. exactly. Yeah. You, have, you sort of have to pay attention for sure. Yes. But but what I like about it is it just drops you the fuck in. Like the, the pre credit sequence is a mini mission that you're straight into. So who the yeah. fuck are these people? They're spies. They're doing this mission. Wow. That someone nearly died. Th this is intense shit. Da, 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 da. By the way, <laughs> bring, bring in, bring in the, the original thing back. Just it's fucking so good. fantastic. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that like, theme is just nobody. so good. <laughs> yeah. The, the original mission impossible theme is just iconic. And it getting a fresh, like, lick of paint for the years here is just brilliant. And obviously, they've kept it throughout and updated it each movie. And Limp Biscuit did a version, didn't they? With uh, uh, the musical the genius, one, yeah. that is Fred Durst. <laughs> oh, the, no. the John Woo one. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so you have that. You're like, holy shit. And it is like seat of the pants. Like, it just fuck. And then... You're on a you're on the mission that you think is gonna be, oh, this is the story. No, the entire team you've just met and met in the pre-credit sequence yeah. is dead. It's famous They're actors all... and everything, yeah. yeah. Yeah, famous actor all Poor right Emilio now, yeah. Estevez. Zadruzzi. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, got fucking iced, dude. And it's like uh, you know, uh, you're like, what the fuck? And, and then now you're on the run with Tom Cruise and it's kind of the fugitive and the movie hasn't even really started. So, and, 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 and this is like 10 know, minutes in or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, so this is the, this is why the movie sort of succeeds, I think, because you can question some of the ropey stuff, but it just keeps moving. It is so fast paced. It, it's set pieces it's gruesome deaths it's you know kind of banter 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 between the the spies um i mean the movie gets so much better when ving rams turns up i think and and um jean reno as, as, as well yeah uh it, it you know it's it's it, it's like it's stupid in a way like and it's so over the top but it's fun it's it, you know it's 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 a fun movie that doesn't fuck around. There's no long exposition, you know, w without you getting a little treat for paying attention. Here's an action sequence. Shut the fuck up. Here's one of the best ever depictions of hacking in the CIA headquarters ever in a film. Like I, you, I mean, know, it, it, look, I you know I haven't seen this movie in many many years, and 
I think it's still highly memorable. The thing that yep. is funny about this movie is that it's not the plot that is particularly memorable. I think the idea of the mole hunt is much more interesting to me now. And maybe when I was younger, I didn't fully grasp, you know, how how intricate and, and kind of interesting it is as a plot device. But I mean, what everybody remembers is just the the hack into the CIA, which in my mind also was later in the film. It's actually quite early on in the film. There's a lot of film after they get the knock It's like in list. the middle of the movie, basically. Yeah, it's like yeah. in the middle of the movie. But everybody yeah. remembers that scene with, with uh, Tom Cruise suspended in midair above the floor where everything is trapped in this room. And the tension yep. that is created in that scene and just the set with like the white lit, lit up floors yep. and him, you know, hacking while he's while he's like, you know, completely horizontal is just so iconic that it's one of those film scenes that you just never, ever, ever forget. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it, the set pieces are what really separates this movie. You know, just just to ask you a, qu a question, Monty, because you did sort of say, you know, a big stupid uh, uh, train. <laughs> It is super, you know, chase. It is super long, but I mean, I also like. I also think again. I, I mean, I think that's like there've been so many action sequences on trains down the fucking years. Because dude, even gives... this year. So first off, in yeah. the latest Mission Impossible, there is another scene on top of a train because yeah. Tom Cruise famously did a stunt where by himself, which is amazing, by the way, especially because he's like fucking 60 years old or whatever. He literally jumps a motorcycle off of a cliff, opens a parachute, and then parachutes on top of a train where then there's a chase on the train. So I have to say, because the last Mission Impossible film I saw was Dead Reckoning, and then I just saw this one, it did feel a little samey. And also because sure. I, for the Nerd Legion show I did with Doa, we watched the newest Indiana Jones, in which there is also another train scene. And now Indiana Jones has way too many train chase scenes. So I'm kind of, I have to say, I'm kind of burnt out yeah. on the old train no, I, chase scene. But, but I mean, what, what's, again, within context, because uh, it's specifically the, what's it called? The TGV Channel. or whatever is it? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the fast train. It's fast. Yeah. It's a fast one. <laughs> Yeah, you know, uh, not just like you know the Orient <laughs> Express or whatever. You know, it's like an actual fast, you know, super fast train. Um, you know, so it's sort of an update of an old trope that you see sure. in movies. Because obviously, you know, uh, uh, what's more exciting than a fist fight? A fist fight on top of a fucking train, where if you put one foot wrong, you fall <laughs> off and you die. You know? And, and like, what's so... what's more exciting than that? A fist fight on top of a bullet train going two hundred miles an hour, which I exactly. do give them credit for With because the they, it does it does have real weight that scene because yeah. they got like the actual wind right where he's you know he has to he has to hold on or he literally just flips over entirely onto yeah. his back so it was i've never seen that before i've never seen that again right so it does have some uniqueness to it but for me the the entire ending of this film just feels really overdone because everything else about this movie is subtlety you know what I mean? Mm. It's about finding this mole. It's about covert operations. It's about, you know, using your intelligence and conversation to suss out that Jim Phelps is the guy that you're looking for and putting all the, the clues and pieces together. And at the end, it just turns into one of the most preposterous action sequences with this helicopter inside the channel tunnel, which obviously couldn't keep lift in there. I mean, the whole premise is just stupid. And it really broke me out of it in the end. And including just, you know, Tom Cruise, like, leaning back and he's, like, trying to decapitate him with the helicopter blades while they're getting pulled along inside the channel tunnel. It's just so dumb. It just breaks me out of the moment because it wasn't that kind of movie up until that point. It was a cloak and daggers spy thriller and then all of a mm. sudden it's a massively ridiculous bombastic action set piece and it feels really out of place tonally with the rest of the film 
The yeah, thing totally, is, you're totally. the one who claims to like all the other Mission Impossible movies, which are just worse than that. Like, they that times 10. And also, I'll just say it right now, I don't believe... I'll just say, I think I, Tom Cruise doesn't do any of these stunts. You can all believe the fucking PR all day long if you want. Like, I don't think there's any insurance company in the universe would insure you. And if you think a fucking Hollywood actor, the people who sit in their fucking trailer having a sissy fit because they didn't get exactly the shade of, like, fucking nailed the project. If you think those people would hang off of there for a shot... Listen, you know what? I'll tell you the bridge over fucking Brooklyn right after the show. Just let me know. Best price, nearest offer. You know, I don't believe any of that shit. So the reason why I find that mad is like, that's what a, what a weird angle to take if you ever enjoy Mission Impossible or James Bond movies. Like James Bond, like the reason why that Austin Powers skit is so funny is James Bond really is like, get me sharks, but with lasers on their heads. That's James yes. Bond. Like, so to me, yeah. I would even say it, this movie, here's why it's good. I despise modern James Bond. This is a modern James Bond movie. It's just not called James Bond. It's yeah. actually really Really good if you like classic James Bond movies in the seventies and eighties. This is your shit right here. It's a, so, like an updated version. So again, it's not that if if the entire movie was one way or another, I think it would be fine. What I'm saying is, I felt that there was a massive tonal shift in the kind of film I was watching. I just need to buy into the believable, the universe that is created, and I think that that last chase scene was not in keeping with everything else that had been in the movie up until that point. And it was really, I felt jarring tonally. If it was all that, I could almost forgive it. Just like I, you know, all of James Bond is just over the top and cheesy. And I, I'm along for the ride, right? It just felt like I got off one ride and got on another one in this movie. And it was very, very different. Like, by the way, the other thing is as well, just like, I actually think this really is just a Bond film without being called James Bond. It does, it does the things Bond does better. Like, for example, yeah. it every single item and trick thing invented in the beginning doesn't have Q like doing like this. They give you like a very simple explanation for like a second or two and they all recur but in a place it would be logical to put it. Whereas the sure. difference is in James Bond, they stupidly in James Bond give him the thing at the beginning and he doesn't like, 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 like almost like the fucking 60s Batman. Like, and of course, James, this is your shark repellent spray and they just ask that in his yeah. pocket the whole time then later on even though he has no choice he ends up in a yeah. shark tank like bloody hell oh I've got that in this yeah. what they do is he has the something that he uses gum. for an earlier mission and then he yeah. essentially just realises like another use later on and so actually yeah. it's quite clever the way they set up all so like like for example as you know the problem with the other movies second one on is they really abuse that mask tech the use of it in this movie is really well done like they save oh, it the so they can price. do the reveal yeah. to trick yeah. the wife of the Jim Phelps guy that's it if you'd, if you'd have done it 15 times already you'd have, you'd have fucked it already but the fact that they sort of save it back means like there's actually like like I could believe someone could watch that scene and actually think that was Jim Phelps and not know that that's going to be Tom Cruise, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm glad you brought up Bond, actually, because uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I, I wanted to talk about the parallels because I actually agree. Um, I think 90s Bond, I think Pierce Brosnan Bond is better than Daniel Craig Bond, just as movies. Oh, is he? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I think the... I think a couple the... of them are. You Look, a I like GoldenEye a lot. Uh, and Tomorrow Never Dies is fine but you get into some of the other ones the later ones are just trash man the later ones are just trash no, the pierce yeah but, but oh, oh, okay so what i'm saying is take the entire block of pierce brosnan so gold night tomorrow never dies uh world's not enough die another day you take all them right and then you stack them up against quantum of solace <laughs> spectre Easy. spectre is one of the worst movies i've ever Average. seen like spectre yeah, it's terrible. is absolute skyfall trash. is okay um yeah, I mean, like, Skyfall is probably the best of the bunch. Yeah, Although, I agree. You know, I, I, I fucked with Casino Royale right up until the point where they poison his drink in the casino and he has to go out to the car and defibrillate himself. <laughs> and then he just comes back and goes, that last drink nearly killed me. Like, right now, fuck <laughs> off, Bond. I'm out now, bro. You've gone too far with this shit. That's, that's fucking stupid. That last drink nearly killed me. You've just defibrillated yourself. You don't just get up and sit at the table and get out. Oh, I'm in on this hand now. Like, what the fuck? You, you have a long lie down. <laughs> Even so, so this is why I asked earlier why Monty's not can't fuck with the end of it. So you're fine with Casino Royale, where it's like, but I have a straight foot. Shut the fuck up. You can't <laughs> yeah, no, will that to happen. Terrible. It's not yeah. like that's actually the, that's by definition the worst writing possible, Monty. Yeah, no, that's no, no, just no. I, hey, hey, man, hey, man, the hey, man, I'm, I'm not, I'm not here. I'm awful. not here to it's defend awful. Casino Royale. Stop putting this on no. me. Yeah, no, no, you're right. I, I won't put it. But yeah, don't, don't, don't why 
why is this my, why that, is Casino Royale my fault? That, that bit, Stop, that put bit. your acting like GoldenEye, stupid mate. GoldenEye's like I a like fucking Golden documentary I just, said, that. I just said I liked GoldenEye. What the hell? I just said I liked it. <laughs> right, GoldenEye, GoldenEye is 95, and this is 96. And so you can see immediately why it has a certain... It couldn't just be a spy movie. Because what, what what I actually think is I think the Mission Impossible movies, I think that I even think the later ones, which I'm I'm guessing Duncan doesn't like as much. But I think I those seen like, the later ones. I, I think I, I see I've watched every Mission Impossible movie. It's really weird. It's not like it's not a, it's not a series. I sort of would say, Oh, you've got to watch Mission Impossible. Okay. But wh- wh- every time there's a Mission Impossible movie, I will watch it. And so I I I and I've rewatched Mission Impossible movies, you know a lot more than bond and i think while i think 90s pierce brosnan bond is kind of like yeah it is 90s and they are a bit silly uh they they they're in that bond tradition of you know a a villain with an interesting quirk and big set pieces and mission impossible is kind of doing that and then when they reboot it with daniel craig and they're trying to make it a bit more serious and they're trying to make it a bit more believable and realistic which spoiler have you seen fucking have you seen moonraker what are you talking about <laughs> that's actually that's actually why though i do like up into the 90s of bond films and i like this film mm. because to actually say, well, what we should do is take Bond and it should actually be like, you know, psychologically, what would inform a man like that? And what sort of problems would he have with women? You missed the whole point. Like, you've actually, you're actually the idiot who takes Batman and goes, who, how would the tire pressure remain full while he's doing stunts yeah. and that? And how would it go? You missed the whole point. Like, listen, there's a million movies for you. Like, every other movie that isn't a superhero movie is for you. But you're trying to take that and make it some like fucking psychological drama or something. Like, to me, that's not the purpose. Like, essentially, this movie, like, we're talking about is just a story to get you between three or four massive action set pieces like the aquarium yeah. scene and the fucking the hack by the way probably the most iconic hack ever in film i agree yes. richard's the only one that even yeah. comes off as like this is actually interestingly done it's not just a guy sitting down going i'm in the dear person the yeah. it's not that like in every system. other fucking movie you've seen yeah, <laughs> yeah then later on you have the whole thing where I mean, even the way he meets the fucking Max person straight fire, like that whole set up yeah. and the fact that he has like the, by the way, I even think some of the most underrated scenes are the ones where he has to use his guile. Like he has to trick the arms dealer so he can get what he wants. He has to actually like pretend to the John, John um, Reno guy that he, he doesn't have that disc. Does he use in like a bit of misdirection? And Those are the best parts all, of the movie. Really, those are really yeah. well done. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, here's the problem. A movie like that essentially has to have some element that's a little bit implausible because to me, that's why you watch the movie. You want to see something that couldn't happen in real life, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, look, that's what Bond what, is to me as well, you know? So I, what, what, I just what, hate when they I, try and bring it in the real world. Yeah. What, what I will say as well, just to talk about the hack part, right? Which is, I mean, arguably the best scene in the whole movie. I, I want to say that it's like, it's a masterclass of building tension because there's so many moving parts and so many things that can go wrong before he's even in the room where if you're or if you make a sound above like a millionth of a decibel you're going to trigger the alarm if if you touch any part of the walls the floor it's going to trigger the alarm uh, you know before if you raise the temperature in, too much it's going to yeah, trigger the alarm, it's, trigger the alarm. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's this it's, it's insane because there's so many things that can go wrong um, and, and it cuts between Tom Cruise doing this ridiculous physical, you know, performance and Ving Rams toast, toast, you know, doing this and, and saying like, you know, the whole thing's going to blow if we go beyond this point. But even before it gets there, they have to put an emetic in someone's drink. They have to follow them to the toilet, you know, get the password off the desk to get into the, th- and, and, and what the Palmer does in it's, it's, it's his, it's what he does it's the iconic cutting tension the music the strings it's building up you really get a sense of tension here and he he did this in carlito's way the last scene where they're at the train station and they're going up and down the escalators and carlito's hiding and you know you think he's going to get away is he you know no, no. like that scene just in terms think about what the subject is it's an it's it's meant to be the hacking scene in every other movie is a nerd hunched over a keyboard buy me more time that's what it is to bring it into this insane physicality and then it's the smartest thing in the film
I, I mean, it's, it's, I mean it's, the it's mechanism of showing that like actual like temperature thing is genius. Mm. If people don't mm. realize, I would, my analogy would be that's like that radar and aliens. Like that's what creates the tension because you've got yeah. like a thing, a display that's showing you without someone just constantly saying, yeah, exactly. shit, it's going to go off the alarm. Like, if you just do that all the time, you, you'd ignore it. But the fact that you're also going, but the it's 72.9. It's almost <laughs> there. Like you, you, you can understand the tension. It translates very easily. Mm. Well, it's also not only yeah. that, but there's an, there's actually another great hacking scene in this movie at the beginning that also has a lot of tension because Emilio Estevez's oh. character is on top of the elevator, and right? Elevator. And that's yeah. how he actually dies. They found very good ways to make hacking much more high stakes and interesting in this film than in almost any other Hollywood film. I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the way and, I also think is, oh, go on. No, I was just going to say, and it's like, you know, that is... That 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 is like where the, where the movie succeeds. It, it it takes espionage, which should be you know you think about like Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Uh, I love like that movie by the fuck, way. Yeah. I right? fucking love you, that movie. <laughs> sure, you, but you you think about you think about how like dry espionage actually. Oh, incredibly, is. yeah, yeah. You know, like it's 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 being sat in a fucking hotel, staring out of a window every five minutes. It's meeting people in bars and sliding cocktail napkins across each other without anyone knowing, and then just leaving without a word being said. You know, you think about what espionage was historically in films until this comes. And suddenly, you know, yeah, it's very nineties, but it's espionage. You know, brought up to sort of like the bond fantasy it, it, you know because that's the funny part about bond he was a spy who did no fucking spying like I, bond <laughs> when, was, when where were the espionage scenes in bond no he's just a one-man wmd you know uh, every every scene at the start of a bond movie is him getting out of bed with a beautiful woman putting on the tuxedo and then he, he's off to fucking go and murk someone and then it's just like action sequence action sequence action sequences that even in the even in the supposedly realistic daniel craig here, there's not there's no fucking <laughs> under us like binoculars you know there's none of that right and so i i think what they i think what they did here is to sort of make spies exciting again is kind of like that, that that that's the movie's like a long-standing uh... legacy I, I don't know. I, I I couldn't help. I'm glad you brought up Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy because I couldn't help but think about that because obviously it's another movie about a mole hunt, right? Uh, yeah, within exactly. so, I just vastly prefer that film because of the subtlety oh, of it, right? It's a it's a better film, and it, it, you know, and it's got. Let's be real, it's got better source material. I mean, you know, but. Um, yeah, but but I mean, it, it's a much better film. But it, but again, if I, like, let's imagine. Oh, do you want to watch a spy movie? Oh, spy like what? Like James Bond? Mission Impossible? You put that on. You, you, you make, Just give you me make... a number. Are you ready? <laughs> Think a Taylor Soldier spy grossed eighty million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Mission Impossible One grossed four hundred and fifty-seven million dollars. Yeah. So yeah. case closed. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Remember, exactly. that's the other thing about this movie as well, Monty. This is supposed to be a fucking popcorn movie. So sure. the actual, yeah. it's actually quite cerebral for that. It's actually like you say, it's putting some things in there that aren't just for the moron who's going. What did he say? What's that character again? Like, look, he that guy will get to enjoy the set pieces, but he will never actually know like why. why what did Jim Phelps betray them? What was going on with the thing there? I even think one thing they do very cleverly in this movie because of the premise that he's on the run is that's why it's so brilliant that he goes and steals the knock list because what they do is they they get even the people who are hunting him to hype the fuck out of him and be like you think we could just catch a man like that he's been in all these different places like they actually show you that with that skill set what if he did actually turn on the main people right. like yeah. he's basically the only person who could break into your own base and get that shit and get away because he has like the full package of skill set basically like I say he is like a James Bond basically yeah what can we do Bond a guy at the airport how many identities do you think hunt has how many times has he slipped past customs in how many countries these guys are trained to be ghosts we taught them to do it for christ's sake yeah I mean, and also similarly i also thought this was cool as well the idea that, like, even though, remember, he never has betrayed anyone. He actually is just a straight-up spy who gotten fucked by everyone. But then what a great premise that to build your team to go back in, it's just like a fucking Suicide Squad scenario where you get other people on the disavowed list. Yeah. That's actually <laughs> genius. Whoever thought it's that angle, that's a really cool angle as well. Yeah, because also, if you think about it, right, in theory, they don't totally know he's innocent. Like, they think he's just part of a criminal gang now doing it. Also, I thought... It, the other thing about this movie, by the way, is the message of this movie is this, that... Well, 
among spies, essentially anyone who's dishonest. It's like the movie, the essence of the movie is summarized as there's no honor among thieves. Everyone who's involved with betraying each other, by definition, will betray anyone else to themselves get what they want. So the Max character betrays the Ethan Hunt character. The fucking Jim Phelps guy betrays that. Even the wife is clearly, I think, trying to play them both, but she betrays the Ethan Hunt one eventually. Everyone in the movie, essentially, except Ving Rames, who was just presented as, like, the <laughs> ultimate, like, fucking sidekick dude or whatever. Cheers. To you, Luther. Because yeah, actually, best. that's a, I love it. Dude, that's I, a subtle I, point I think people will miss. There's a very subtle point in this movie, which is everyone else. Like, John Reno is just a mercenary. He's just clearly a guy. Like, he just does, does what you have to do and gets the money. The Ving Rhames character, they tried to explain this, and this is a very subtle point that's lost, is the majority of people who were hackers were never evil people. They were always mm. people who started out as, like, they had curiosity about computer systems, or they, for example, they had incredibly libertarian ideas about freedom, like, uh, but essentially the famous saying was, like, information wants to be free. Like, they're actually people who have sort of almost a philosophical bias to what they're doing. They're not just people who hack because they get $7 million. Think about how they even get the Ving Rhames character on board. It's not because they tell him, well, we'll give you $50 million, or... That they have to lure him in with the idea to be the greatest hack of all time. It's the intellectual challenge. And then when he, <laughs> he finds cool out computers. what they are hacking, <laughs> the knock list, he literally, essentially, it's in, it's directly said in the dialogue. He wouldn't want that list to get out there, even though he's a hacker, because he knows that if you're doing so, by the way, this is another thing I don't think people will understand about this, the backdrop of this movie. The idea is if that list comes out, every embedded spy will just be killed tomorrow. And by the way, a little aside, you can do some Google on this if you want. Don't worry, I will just say it this way. I think I have seen stories where the US has accidentally fucking revealed lists like that before, and they have actually gotten people potentially killed. In fact, there's certain people Richard might know about, is about five Years ago in politics, who were just doing that as like a political game, like outing other people's like embedded people with like two and three identities. So that's a very real massive fear in the intelligence community, is exactly that thing. That's essentially their apocalyptic moment, you know, where it's all over if that happens. So I actually thought, like, they, they it's not like the Vingram character is just a joke in that sense. He actually is one of the only characters in the movie with sort of an ethos who actually is yeah. like a good guy behind the fact he's doing illicit activities, you know. I, I love the fact as well that I think, other than Ethan Hunt, I think he's the only guy that's like the recurring character because like, yeah because they add know, simon like, Pegg later in the series and he becomes yeah, a recurring yeah. character but ving rames is in everything yeah yeah, yeah like and I, I you know i i, I mean i just i just love ving ving rames if I can that's great i think he's yeah uh but i mean I, he adds he adds something to this film that it needs like in terms of you know i think duncan might be right maybe it's a bit more of a moral kind of compass or something but 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 he but he adds a light touch to it like i i think i think it's super important that in a world where everybody is duplicitous like ethan needs a, a sort of a rock you know he needs somebody he can rely on like and i guess for the story yeah uh, luther is his name isn't it it's uh, yeah, yes. yeah it, 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 it's him and I think that's that that's important because if everyone was a piece of shit, <laughs> you know like it would probably be a bit more wearing but there's some really good buddy interplay that that I think the film needs it, it it just gives it a bit more of a a lighter touch, um. But yeah, I mean, look, I I, I think overall, I, I I think the film does a lot good, uh, you know. Uh, it, 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 there's a lot that I really sort of like about the movie, but but there are some bits where it's like, I think the editing is a bit weird. I don't know how I feel about the way it's edited. There's like a lot of fucking Dutch angles. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like whenever yeah. they're in a, a suspenseful moment, so it just my, cuts the angle, the angle. You know, it's my kinda... favorite. My favorite one that was just really rather random was uh, Kittrich, the IMF director. When they were do when they had the dinner in the aquarium restaurant in Prague, it was like that, every that angle was below yeah. for no reason, and I thought it really. Yeah. It was very bizarre and didn't actually serve to advance any kind of themes in the conversation because it made him look really nefarious before he had kind of played his hand about the whole like mole hunt angle, right? That is correct. The actual list is secure at Langley. Galitzin was a lightning rod. He was one of ours. This whole. And yeah. it was really yeah. overdone as well. And the angle was just it, so severe that I found it the quite explosion, distracting. The explosion in that movie, dude. Like, when he throws the explosive chewing gum, which, again, I don't... 
you see, they handled the mask stuff way better than the chewing gum stuff. The chewing gum is like, yeah, if you put this together, it'll blow it up. And then in the next scene, he's using it. Um, uh, but the, the the explosion blows that one dude through the window. Like, he fucking goes... Like, it's insane. The, 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 there is no explosive force that could propel a person like that at that speed without just atomizing them. But then everyone else in the restaurant... It's just, ooh, loud bang. Like, what, what the <laughs> fuck? Is, that scene is so weird. And then Tom Cruise jumps through that broken window as the aquarium is like, it's not even a big aquarium. It's just like a little bit of water. There's just like two fish on the ground like, floating around. <laughs> he, jumps, he jumps through that like smashed window and it's like, he does a weird little sort of like girly run, like kind of like arms up here. And I'm like, what is happening in this scene right now? It's like so weird like I, I i thought that i thought that scene sucked ass like i was also like, I, also you know I, the fact I, that I was, that was the restaurant the restaurant was packed full of the imf agents who were on the bull yeah. hunt and then suddenly none of them can run out there and chase him across that massive open square yeah, exactly. And it's like, so he wasn't doing he wasn't doing an iconic Tom Cruise six pack sprinting for fucking ten hours straight. He's dodging like, fish he's, on the like, ground, man. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. He's like, arms out, slipping, and like he runs off into the night, like you know, fucking, you know, it's so ridiculous. But yeah, you, you know, and why, why, why do that? Why, why, what, what is it? I suppose it tells us a little bit about how observant Ethan is. But do we need that scene where he goes twelve o'clock? That was the guy behind there. No, 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 no. And, and he lists all the agents who are in the the second IMF team, and it's like didn't spot them, didn't didn't bring it up during the mission. Dude. Like, <laughs> of course not. Didn't yeah, didn't say like oh that that waiter looks a bit. To, sus. to be fair, to that. be fair, to be fair, uh, Ethan Ethan Hunt may be a bit dim because it not only happens in that scene where he could only put these things together. After the fact, which also he yeah. must just have an absolutely incredible visual memory so that he can remember everything that happens to him. But putting that aside, because also remember that when he's talking to Jim Phelps, when he finds him, that's when he realizes that Jim Phelps faked shooting himself and falling into the river. That's when he yeah. realizes um, why Phelps's wife wasn't in the car when it exploded. Right. He couldn't put it together before that point in time for whatever reason, yeah. even though he's had a long time to think about this. Yeah, that you, is you, though. That's actually. I don't think you can say that because the whole point is he is tricked like we are. Like he is literally mm. shown information which uh, you'd have no reason to disbelieve the context. Like the Jim Phelps guy literally shows like a POV camera shot of he got all blood leaking, and then he falls into a river, and then like he does that car does just blow up in a way where it's killed someone like that, and you can't quite tell who's done it. You never know who until the end of the movie who stabbed the people through the fence, etc. Like I actually thought that was quite well done, and the the notion I took was never the idea that he knew that. The whole time i took mm. it to mean like you say he has a very good visual memory and that's what he's been obsessing about after that like what what was going on in the background like because obviously you have to know it can't be one person just doing it all I mean, you'd need coordination to get all this stuff done and then to me the whole yeah. thing of this is i think this is a part a lot of people miss they don't understand why at that meeting he doesn't just go right well i know it's him so why do i even go and do the rest of it no no because the key point there is this is a very well done point in the movie is they haven't just pointlessly put a love interest in just for the that's the mm. thing that will always cloud a logical man's mind. Yep. That is the most classic is skill as old as time. Like yep. it's the same reason why what's weird is men will do this towards women, but they never flip the script. So men will go, Why does a woman just stay with a guy who beats her? It's like because she's in love with him, you fucking idiot. So she wants to believe like it's for other reasons, or that maybe she did something and she's rationalizing it and she's not seeing the reality. And in fact, she can't because her brain's protecting her, knowing that all of her feelings are for this particular person. So she doesn't want to see them as a villain, a bad person. But what they don't get is how many bloody film noir movies did we watch where that is the central yeah. way you trick the main guy? He might be the most straight fire detective. PI, but if the white, if the right woman who's touched his heart and has a connection with him cries on his shoulder, he forgets about it all. He, he lets it pa pass. He doesn't like connect two details earlier. So I actually thought that was well done because essentially that's the whole real reason, not really about the knock list. The real reason he has to do that train sequence is he has to actually get that woman to essentially confess that she isn't with him. She's betraying him, which, like mm. I say, is actually pretty good use of the mask thing. It's actually one of the less egregious ones. That she looks pretty good that scene. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think. Oh that's, no, and the actress is very well cast as well. What an amazing seductory, seductive actress yeah, oh, as well. Sure. By the way, in the days before, they all just fucking pumped their lips up. She actually has like the actual straight fire, fucking perfect yeah. outy lips. You know, what a yeah. great piece of casting. Yeah, I mean, look, what what I'll say is, I, th I think you hit the nail on the head. I, I I agree with Monty in the sense that I think if you were involved in spycraft and you were this like deep embedded intelligence dude, you would trust fucking nobody. And the minute the mission went sideways, you probably would be thinking, "I didn't see a body. I didn't see a body." <laughs> yeah, that's We've the big not problem. John body. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, what, exactly. but what I'm also saying is, exactly. for the movie to work. For the movie to work, we have to discover it as Ethan Hunt. I know, but here's the and biggest... That, and, and the movie does do that well. Absolutely. He, here's the biggest flaw, is that Kittredge never finds Jim Phelps' body, which is like, he fell yeah. into a river in the middle of fucking Prague. Yeah. Wouldn't you be curious? Like, obviously you would suspect him as the mole if you never find his body. Yeah, it's like 10 foot of water. Yeah, yeah, you know, so yeah, you would have, <laughs> oh, you, 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 yeah, <laughs> and as I said, people, like, spies must be faking their own death, like, every fucking five exactly. minutes, you know what I mean, like, yeah, so, so, so I, I, I get it, like, there's no way you could be Ethan Hunt and not immediately go, yeah, this is a bit, a bit, a bit suspicious, <laughs> but obviously, for the purposes of the movie, and this is another thing, again, this is why, you know, Brian De Palma's, like, sort of a great guy to do it, the idea of the twist, a, a lot of his movies have that. A lot of his movies have the twist. Now, remember, in the 90s, every film had to have a twist. Like, The Usual Suspects comes out. It does the, one of the best twists ever in cinema yeah, history. Great. And you just get 10 years of twists. <laughs> and M. Night Shyamalan comes along. Fight Club. Twists forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, twists. <laughs> like, yeah, just, everything's a twist. Like, And so it, it, it now we're at the point where, oh, okay, yeah, he's an imaginary dude. Yeah, all but right, yeah, he dreamt it. Yeah, yeah, whatever. And everyone's just so jaded with it all. But, like, the, 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 the twist in this movie is kind of, because it's a twist and then another twist. So it's kind of done, it's, it's done well. It's not like, it, it's before twist movies kind of jump the shark. And again, I, I think I think like the Palmer is is the go-to guy for that. You know, he always even in like movies that don't really need a twist, he puts a little twist in it, like Sean Penn getting killed in Carlito's way and Benny Blanco and all that stuff. You know, you like, know, one of my issues with the twist in this movie is because it moves so fast. Uh, it's it's very concerned with, as you pointed out, Richard, getting from one set piece to the next. Yeah. Is that the twist really? lacks any kind of emotional resonance for me because they kill kill Jim Phelps so quickly at the beginning of this that unless to Thorin's point earlier you know who Jim Phelps is from the from the television series Mission Impossible I have no affinity for this character so it doesn't really feel important when the twist occurs if you occurs. were a fan of the TV series though you would I, I appreciate that, but uh, I, my argument would be that a well-made movie would set up more of Jim Phelps well, and Ethan sure. Hunt's relationship to make me yeah. feel something later on. And I think that if this movie is so obsessed with the the nature of the plot and moving the plot along at a good pace, which I think is admirable in most cases. But for me, it drops out some of the emotional resonance that we should have mm -hmm. in this film because the relationship between the characters is never really developed because of how hastily they want to move along the kind of espionage nature of this thing. And I also think that at the end of the day, um, Jim Phelps's motivation for being the mole is also very badly explained. Uh, during the movie, and that was another factor that I think made me. In what way? I don't think that the, it's very explicit as to why he is conducting the actions that he is conducting. Like you know you that the literal speech where he explains that yes. essentially he used to be like the person who essentially yes. like was like American foreign security, and then now in a post Cold War world, yes. he is going to be relegated to just being like some fool. And it's almost like you get the golden watch, like goodbye, have a nice career. I think that's a really good motivation because the premise there goes right. Unless you were just some true blue American Boy Scout. And by the way, there's no one like that in any spy agency in the world. One of the most famous concepts that I actually learned from reading a lot of different books about real spies is the concept of a double agent, by the way, 
is you actually have to really believe it. You actually have to really be a spy for both sides. And supposedly the intelligence systems themselves know that. And that's why actually kind of like this movie, they don't just go, right, well, you finish being a double agent, you can come back. No, no, they always know, like to some degree, that person always operates in kind of a fucked up, it's like intellectual no man's land, as it were, where they could be on either side because they have to like do things like have real relationships, like marry someone, be part of a foreign agency, do certain missions that succeed for the enemy, give real info. By the way, there's another thing people won't get. You don't, as an as a double agent like movies, you don't give them fake info and get their real. You have to actually take like being a journalist, Richard. You have to give them a little bit of real info to get more real info yourself. Like it's actually one of the most interesting parts of it. So to me, I thought that worked really well as a motivation because that's the sort of person. Think about what Ethan Hunt did when forced to, who's sort of like, wait. So I have this incredible skill set, and I've essentially saved everyone a million times over. But now I'm consigned to nothing. It's like, what if I just, you know what? I've I've solved a million of these fucking break-ins and things myself. Why don't I just fucking nick the shit? In that case, fuck you. Why don't I use all the skills you gave me? I'll fake my own death, steal all the shit and just get away scot-free and put pin it all on you. I so, thought that was actually a very good motivation. So I, I, I can agree with you if it wasn't about the knock list where he knew that a bunch of peop undercover people were going to get killed. Because it's almost mm -hmm. like if you were going to betray it for your own purposes, I don't see why you would betray and potentially get everyone who is part of your espionage career killed at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's that's where I kind of lose the connection between what he's trying to do. Well, that wasn't what he did, though, remember? He was actually, well, in theory, as far as I can tell, that's where just the movie starts, though, right? The problem is Jim Phelps just wants to disappear. If he disappears, remember, Ethan Hunt gets blamed for it all, and then he can just do whatever he wants at that point in time. He's just got, like, free reign to do anything in the world. No one can stop him. But the point is, then, when Ethan Hunt steals a real knock, that's like a separate plot line to me. It's not really connected to the Jim Phelps. Yeah, but, but at the end mm -hmm. of the day... I also he's... think, by the way, as an aside... Actually, another detail I think is mad subtle, but it's brilliant, is that is that whole thing of like using the Bible verses and the fact that like the, it ends up having the stamp of the Drake Hotel. Because if people don't know, yeah. one of the other things people don't understand about spies is it isn't all just you get a secret document. One of the things is, is the idea, this is why famously they, they claim in history, sometimes newspapers were doing this. It's the idea that wherever you are in the world, you have to be able to access the same kind of information and document that another person somewhere else has that you can then encode things via. Well, one of the most perfect ones ever, anyone who ever traveled in America knows is that they put those Gideon Bibles in every yep, fucking yep, hotel agree. room for free. Yep. And so that would be the ultimate like thing to go right open to page seven. And then they do wherever they are, they've got the same fucking one in their little hotel room. And then they use that as the code to like transmit. That's the one area that doesn't hold up by the way, ironically, but you didn't mention it is essentially the way he's just using like Usenet and just fucking typing Bible verses. Like, <laughs> like that's absolutely, but that doesn't make any sense at all. But again, you suspend your disbelief for that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. this is, you have to remember this is 1996. This no, is still this where is... people are like, Win Holy no, shit. this like, is the, this amazing. is I, you know, I, I, I give I give it the, I give it a pass because every single '90s movie about computers is treating them like magic. So you, I just have to awesome. just just uh, uh, you know that's that's the yeah. conceit of '90s and early 2000s action movies is hacking is magic, and we just have to accept that every movie is like that and move on with our lives. Well, as we, it's as basically we the computer about... equivalent of why, like you say, the spy movie doesn't work. Real spying is incredibly boring and tedious. It's about following paper trails. It's kind of like journalism. That's not what spy movies are. Spy movies are like Kung Fu kicks, flip off onto a helicopter, <laughs> like dodge like a shark into like shooting a fucking laser, like beaming it off. It's all that shit. So it's a, this is just the hacking equivalent of it. Because obviously, like I, I've even said this before, the, the movie that tried to do real hacking was the more recent movie, like whatever it was, like five years ago or something. That fucking Black Hat movie Movie that Michael Bandit yeah. it's shit because it's people it's on a real command line typing in fucking like te that's garbage. No, that there's no there's nothing yeah. to that. Like the whole point is the stupidest idea is you never could get a hacker like Swordfish and put a gun against the head and go hack this now. You got four minutes. It's like that's not hacking. Like hacking's things like you call them up and then you're like, oh, I locked out my password. Like, exactly. And you get like one level deeper and then you trade that to someone else for the info to get the password. You know, it's and then you put a back door. In. It's like it's nothing sexy that never appear on screen. You know, yeah, it would never I, wouldn't I, work I think... on screen. I, I think we talked a little bit about it in the face-off review as well, which was, you know, I don't think at this point in the 90s, people really know how to even put a computer into a scene oh. in an interesting way, which is why you get the stupid things like, case closed. <laughs> 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 you know, because like, how do, you, how do you film it? So as, as I said, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's like, I mean, for me, this film is, I, I, I remembered it as a seven or an eight. And I and objectively, I'm going to say it's a six, but it's a good six. Yeah, it's I agree. The with high that. end of the sixes. Right? There's a, there's um, a lot of but, stuff I liked about this movie, but it just wasn't. Yeah. It it 
there was it just felt kind of disconnected and the highs are like incredibly high and then yeah everything else exactly. is kind of forgettable that hacking scene is still straight fire like oh, it yeah. is one of the it, you know it, there's a reason it was parodied in absolutely everything um and remember as well pre pre matrix right pre bullet time sort of stuff like this was all done in a sort of it's over the top but it's believable it's physical <laughs> Um, Dude, my favorite you know, part so... about that scene is that when his belayer just has to hang on to the rope the entire time mm. for dear life instead of just, I don't yeah. know, having a break for the rope, which you would yeah. obviously yeah. have. He has to all grip it. <laughs> no, there's no tension in that. You know? so, um, Literally, there's but, no so tension. Yeah. <laughs> now yeah. you're maybe going to play out. Obviously, you were. This is just classic Thor and Jork. I'm just going to say this. In a Hollywood movie, a French person just gets assaulted by a rat for no reason. I didn't put that in the movie. <laughs> Listen, it's right up my alley, but I didn't put that in the movie. That's just a plausible plot. You go, well, maybe he's been eating some cheese or something, you know. <laughs> that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Why does that just appear for no reason? But yeah, what? It does. It does. Yeah, you, you, you do you, De Palma. You do you. I know. How, did he, how did he kill the rat without making any noise that would trigger, trigger the decibel meter? <laughs> yeah, true. Um, yeah, just, it, just, it, so well, need. just. Just, it's it. just a natural <laughs> yeah. Jean, Jean, Jean Renault. Um, no, I, I do want to quickly just talk about performances because I think obviously it is a film, but for me it's a film without any acting in it. Really? I <laughs> thought Vanessa Redgrave doing. as Max, the weapons no, dealer, was yeah, great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Forget Vanessa Redgrave, right? Like, she's yeah, like, awesome in this, but she's the best character. Yeah, she, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, yeah exactly she, she, she definitely brings some gravitas to the proceedings but you know she's only in it real realistically for a relatively short amount of time uh but i mean like overall i i, I think it's kind of weird it, it just felt very flat like you know john voight eh, you know he, he's sort of in it and he gets to chew the scenery a little bit at the end but i, I, I don't know uh, um they bring in the wacky cast, you know, with Ving, Ving Rams and 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 John Renault, and, and and you're like, eh, I want to kind of see them more. Uh, they they're just sort of in it. <laughs> Tom Cruise is, I don't again, <laughs> he's a bit flat, <laughs> is what I would say. <laughs> Um, it's not a movie about and, and, acting. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, I get that, but, but I mean, I I, I wonder if. It would have elevated it just a little if there'd been a bit more of that. You know, you think about De Palma again. De Palma elicits fantastic performances from most of his actors. As I said, I mean, look, people knew Sean Penn was a good actor, right? But think about Davy Kleinfeld in Carlito's Way and what that did for Sean Penn's profile. You know, that's 93. And you think about how iconic that performance is, you know. Like, it, 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 you can't even believe it's Sean Penn. It's so outrageous and you know do, do you think about you know Carlito Briganti and fucking Tony Montana same actor totally different iconic performances um you know like but, but there's nothing like that in this film there isn't like you don't go yes oh, because you know. there's no time to act because they don't emotionally <laughs> develop the character relationships ever which is part of the problem of the movie mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, maybe that's a deliberate stylistic choice. Maybe you're meant to not have an emotional connection to sort of feel sort of, I mean, I'm not saying it's this clever, right? So <laughs> that's a whack ass wrong, theory, but, yeah. but fine. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Like, think about it, you know, if I'm, if I, you know, I, I don't have an emotional connection, Ethan Hunt can't afford to have emotional connections. Emotional connections are a bad thing to have in Spycraft. But I don't think they are doing that. No, I, I, I just think the movie is so fast- <laughs> paced yes. it, 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 yeah it's just there's none of that there and it sort of makes me sad because i like the cast i think this is kind of like a, a quirky cast it's not like iconic none of these actors are like super big names outside of tom cruise you know john voight was doing fucking anaconda in the fucking 90s it's not like he was a big box office draw jean renault obviously is always known for like you know the, the more kind of you know 
off Hollywood kind of movies that he does. Uh, Ving Rams was just coming to fruition at this point in the middle of the nineties. Obviously, he got his big breakout with Pulp Fiction, and you know it's it's a nice touch to have like Vanessa Redgrave in there. You know she needs no introduction, but obviously at the end, very much at the end of her career. But it's like it's a it's a quirky cast, and I just wish I wish there was just a bit more for them to do because these are all brilliant character actors in their way. And like a lot of Tom Cruise vehicles, they, they generally suffer when it's all Tom Cruise. And I think there is a little bit of that here for me. Of my obvious, I just don't think this is actually a very good actor from Tom Cruise. Like in the 80s, mm. he was just a fucking pretty boy. That's all he was. People only remember essentially Magnolia is like the lever point. That movie yeah. onwards is when he becomes True. like he can, he's just the guy. And he's also, quite frankly, looks like he's put more effort into his craft. He's not just being the big guy in the movie. And, what, and actually, as Richard alluded to before, if people don't know, he's actually one of those people who from that period onwards, I mean, he came huge, was very involved with his own production team. Like if people don't know, he's famously the one that, like, I think it was even a Mission Possible movie. Was and it like paid for it all to get going during COVID or some yeah, shit. And yeah, so yeah, did, that's yeah. why even some people criticize the movie, but like he just kept it going basically. So to me, he's just, he's all right in this. Like he has some parts that are pretty good, some parts a bit whatever. I actually think John Voight's pretty good, but I think John Voight's generally a pretty underrated actor all in all. And then yeah. to me, the main problem this film has is this, is it's actually a movie where you can appreciate the set pieces when you rewatch it, but you can never experience the tension of the first time you watch this movie. Like off the top of my head, I actually think I did see this at the cinema. I think this was maybe like one of the early 12s or something in the UK. I'm almost certain I saw this at the cinema when I was like 13 years old or something. And the action sequences were incredible. Like the, the particularly the hack one was insanely like amazing tension. When they even go on the train at the end, you have no fucking clue how it's going to play out, etc. The problem is... I would describe it as a bit like Fight Club. You can't ever watch that first watch again. You'll never get that the second, third, fourth time. You're watching a different movie at that point in time. So the problem is, even if Monty sounds jaded, I would just say, if you're someone who, I mean, it's too late now because you want to watch this episode, but I actually think you will be glad if you have never seen this film that we did put it in here for you to watch. Like, if you know things like Bond yeah. movies, but you never watched this movie, I guarantee you enjoyed watching it. Yeah, I, I think I think that's the key. I, I think... Um... What this movie is is that first time experience. It's 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 yeah. It, it, it's a film as a ride. It's exhilarating the first time, you know, because you get swept along in the story. And even if you miss some of the details, don't worry about it. Here's a fucking brilliant set piece. Here's a you know in, intricate part of tension. Here's here's a fucking twist. Here's another little crumb, you know, and, and and so by the time you get to the end and the theme kicks in again, you do sort of like you take a beat and you go, okay, that was like that 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 was a legit fucking experience. Now you might go away and sit down and like percolate on it and fucking think, oh, it was kind of fucking dumb a bit though. Uh, Tom Cruise, was <laughs> and all of that stuff. You ain't thinking about that on sure. the day you watch the film, yeah. you know, and and so and and I I I totally. It's like I've said, you know, it was why I was like the last sort of hold out on Fright Night. Uh, um, if a movie sort of succeeds in what it's going for, a movie as an experience, I can very much fuck with it. If it's if it's consistent to itself, its core values, I can find something to like in that film. Um, you know, which is why I had an issue with Face Off compared to this. Because Face Off d does not do that. It I am completely the opposite opinion because I think Face Off succeeds in that and this does not. No, Face Off is one part, oh, it's a family drama, then it's meant to be like an intricate, like fucking, you know, exploration of identity. It's also meant to be a kick-ass action movie. Then there's some doves at the end because realistically <laughs> it was about saving people's souls or some bullshit. It's just John Woo. Just be, John Woo's just been given all the money to do whatever the fuck he wants. And you've got two fucking crazy, like notorious egotistical actors in the central parts. Like it's a, it's, it's, it's a clown fiesta, that movie. This one, with it's Brian so supposed to be <laughs> yeah no, yeah okay mate but i but i i don't think john uh, i said i don't think john woo made that movie thinking i'm gonna make a clown fiesta movie <laughs> what the palmer did here is like he sat down and he said okay i want this to be a modernization of the spycraft i want this to be a thriller in the classic De Palma um tension you know remember two years later he makes snake eyes with nick cage which that you can see the elements that he builds on oh, yeah. mission impossible in that film you know that's like one of those movies no one really talks about it's very interesting it's got, bit of yeah. Yeah, it's got a bit of rashomon in there it's not a great it's worth film a watch. yeah definitely worth a watch um you know so De Palma 
understood like keep in mind, Palmer's not known for his big action set pieces, but because of how he films and how he builds tension and how he uses, you know, scenes and 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 the way it's you know put together, um, it works. You can when De Palma directs an action sequence, it has something uh more traditional actor, you know, you you, you know fucking uh what's he called the one who does the transformer movies you know uh michael um, you bay. Know, he, he, yeah michael no. bay you know when he directs an action <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly when he directs an action movie it's just explosions on the screen you don't feel anything you know when De Palma does an action sequence you do feel something so i think this movie absolutely succeeds as what it's supposed to be there's a reason it generated so much money and excitement at the box office when in reality this was a rebooted property that was mission impossible really that popular was it was it so popular everyone was like sat around going shit man i wish they would reboot that i wish they would bring that back <laughs> i never I, I never got that opinion in the 90s you know when i was there it wasn't really a talked about thing and yet it captured the imagination and i think it's pretty much because this movie promised right and again it's so important that theme tune updated boom three it, minutes it into the pre-credit sequence and you are this we're taking you on a motherfucking ride you are coming along buckle up motherfucker this is a this is a, this is an action movie experience with a bit of brains to it and so uh, you know as i said uh, it's a it's a high six for me it's just, i agree with that it just <laughs> it lacks it just lacks a, a, a bit of soul it just it, it it can't quite elevate itself but for what it is it's excellent if you like this and you want the more intellectual version just go watch tinker taylor soldier spy which we'll probably do on this show at some point we could do a spy one real spy <laughs> real a, a, spy, a real spy <laughs> yeah real spy movie not like this but, but yeah i mean look um, I, 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 I get the impression like out of the three of us, I mean, I think Monty, you're kind of at the lower end. I think Duncan sort of, I, I, I want to get Duncan's sort of capsule review with this film. I want, like how highly do you sort of rate it in the great? Well, like I say, I'm also taking into account that like, if someone's never seen the film, I mm. think it's definitely worth the first time watch. I think the first time watch is going to be the strongest one. This is a movie where, like, the first time watch would probably be like an eight out of ten. Like I say, you'd just be like, this is like a better version of Bond. Like sure. I say, if you actually know the context of the 90s, Bond hasn't even got vaguely like Morsi. It's still very much like wink, wink, jokes to the camera, silly one liners. That's not doing any of that in this movie. I think the only one silly line they have is when they have that guy, that British comedian who's like on the back of the train who just says some line about the fucking the helicopter thing appearing. Or That's about the yeah. one like gag in the movie. But, you know, aside from that, they try to actually keep it pretty much like tension and it's serious stuff. They're not doing that thing, which I despise of the Marvel era, where you're just constantly doing stupid lines and jokes that bring yeah. people out of like a massive action sequence where people are dying, all your friends. That's garbage. <laughs> the first time you watch it, it's really strong. Like I said, the problem I have is it just can't maintain that tension when you revisit it. So the thing is, it's not, it hasn't got like crazy, like next level actor performances. So for me, it's probably more like a 7.5. I do think the one thing that's incredibly underrated, even in this conversation is i think it's an incredibly well shot movie though like the actual like yeah. way it's put together and like the craftsmanship it's not long like it actually does keep mm -hmm. it quite snappy and the pace is pretty good they, they give you just enough of everything like by the way if you are an idiot they'll give you like a few people closing it say things out loud but also you can also sort of enjoy enjoy how they reference things just visually from earlier in the movie so i just thought and also has like a symmetrical ending essentially i just thought it was a very like well like as a, as a piece of like film i think it was very well done by the director i think the director is the one who shines the most out of this yeah definitely and i i, I think other than the editing i i kind of felt like so I, th I think the edit that, that some scenes it just has a bit too much i get what you know brian de palma's trying to do and he's he's always been a guy that went the way his films are kind of cut together um, you know, he he's all about like, you know, multiple shots, you know, in a short space of time. You know, you think about like the end sequence of carry again as a wicked example of that where it's just you know and and he, he, there's some of that here and it's just a bit too much because for for, for the for the story you know I, I just like to sit and let the let it just simmer just a little bit maybe we don't need that extra shot maybe i don't need a weird dutch angle or like monty says maybe we don't need to know that that guy's sinister immediately because you're doing the <laughs> spooky upward uh, you know kind of uh, under the chin kind of shot oh, it's not okay, even right, subtle it's just him. like really yeah, yeah. brutal you know it's a it's very yeah. off it's off-putting i find but but and other than, other, other than that i i've got i've got to say i mean like you know if you ever 
if, if you ever wanted like an introduction to like sort of um you know kind of like what you can do if you take like a really good tenured director and then just give him for, what what could have easily been in anyone else's hands fodder this is this is like the, the the base case i mean brian de palma definitely does something with this movie that again like a michael bay or someone like that like i, I would even argue maybe even a spielberg couldn't do his fingerprints are all over this movie and it gives it a quality that certainly makes it stand out from all the other 90s action suspense movies that were kind of out there at that time all right well next week guys with that uh we will be doing total recall which is i would say a much better movie <laughs> than this one probably I, I think we probably all agree that that's going to be the best movie in this arc fair to say I, I mean, for me, I, I think um, I think it, obviously it should be. Uh, it's it, you know purely and simply because it is a vision, another visionary director who is particularly good at uh, handling adaptations, uh, and it's based on a fucking mega story. It's based on a you know um, an, an, an a mega sci-fi premise. The fact that. Arnie is the main character. And it's like, it, it, it still blows my mind to this day because obviously I think they were, as we'll get into in the episode, they, they, he wasn't the original uh, choice uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And it wasn't meant to be an action vehicle for a muscle bound guy, um, but it works. It, it really does. And, um, you know, I, 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 it's, got, it's got heart and soul. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to rewatching that one. I haven't, as of, recording this but uh total recall i think is going to be mega for me i haven't watched it yet for this like series we're doing mm. but the thing is i already do know that is a really good movie because i have rewatched it many 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 times the difference oh. is i might have already seen mission impossible like twice like i saw it once in like 96 mm. and i maybe might have seen it like i don't know 2005 or something and the other thing i'll say as well i actually think it's a, a worthwhile point to make for this series in general is one of the things that is so irritating about the zuma generation is this default <laughs> assumption that like you already know the full spectrum of taste despite never having tasted any of those <laughs> things. Like it's this thing where you watch a football player now and instead of going, he's amazing. Hey, you guys who saw the other generational players, how does yeah. he compare? You just go, he must automatically be better. I don't need to look at yeah. any other ones because <laughs> yeah. they must be shit. And they do that with movies. So for example, when people go, I can't believe you think that about movies and music. Yeah. You know why you haven't heard any of the music I've listened to or seen any of the movies. So if you've only seen some straight fire movie in like, 2007 you are, you won't have the palate to understand why these things are and sadly it's just the folly of youth i was the same way with many things like food for example you'll think certain foods are like no oh, that's just like but you just be like a poser it's like no you actually have to develop literally your palate to be able to taste certain things and to maybe even tolerate certain tastes that by default aren't what they would be easy to consume so i would just say in general, that's one of the things I think people have a problem with is that they automatically want to just dismiss everything. So the difference is I actually do think Total Recall is one. I've seen so many times throughout my life, not just when I was 15 or 8 or whatever. I've seen that movie probably like maybe a year ago, I even maybe we watched it. That is one that absolutely holds up. It's also a movie yeah. where it doesn't matter that you know what's happening. That's what that's how you know it's well told. And like Richard says, even I think actually the joke is everyone remembers that as an Arnie movie and all the silly Arnie one-liners. But the best thing about it is the fucking straight fire plot. Yeah. Like, the yeah. plot, actually, a lot of people don't even... Like, I think there's a million interpretations of this fucking movie. There's a lot of angles you can tell they're mad edgy at the end. So I think it's actually an underratedly really good script. And as you say, Paul Verhoeven's another just completely forgotten director. Like, think about uh -huh. how he always has, like, an, a cerebral, subversive element in his films. It's not just a straight... Mm -hmm. Played an action Mon movie Monty like and I have talked something. about it? it before, but it's like I remember when Starship Troopers came out. I fucking love Starship and, Troopers. Uh, and I, exactly, I love that film, right? <laughs> I remember going to the cinema if I can see that, right? And uh, my friends, they didn't understand it was satirical. Uh, like, I Reviewers didn't understand my... it was satirical, yeah, dude, yeah. at the time. They, 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 yeah, they thought it was like the bug movie. They thought it was aliens for, for morons. Fucking brilliant and I was like, satire. I was like, yeah, I was like, "What are you talking about? Did we watch the same film?" <laughs> like it was, it was, it was wild. So I'm, I'm su uh, Paul Verhoeven. I can't wait for that to do Total Recall because he's a director who definitely deserves his flowers. And Duncan says, "Like forgotten, you know, be, even even shit like Showgirls is fucking brilliant by comparison <laughs> so to some good. of the drag that comes out." It's now. forgotten about. Well, that's one of those ones actually that could go in that category of like so yeah. bad they're good.
Yeah, exactly. Because totally. essentially, people know this. That movie is the ultimate, like, right. You just know after that movie, someone came into a boardroom, like, right, the cocaine just has to go away. You have to start making movies again. Stop the cocaine parties where someone goes, <laughs> tell you what, would be fucking sick, though, wouldn't it? Like, that's why you can tell that was the end of Hollywood doing that, mate, because that movie's like the ultimate excess, isn't it? It's like Caligula, but the <laughs> 90s version or something. Yeah. All right, guys. So, yeah, uh, look, looking forward to it. Always a, always a pleasure. We'll be back next week with Total Recall. See you then. 